Have you ever been given a gift that made you question everything you believed about a person? You know, you had no idea they were capable of giving such a gift, and you had no idea they felt this way about you. This was a gift that would have been so rare and so expensive And so thoughtful that you could only gasp for air (gasps) as you received such a gift. And as you processed how unreasonable this gift would be for you. Your eyes fill up with tears. And your face shows a mix of overwhelming joy with shame. As you begin to think and to process, I have nothing even close to give in return. You were completely unaware that such a moment was possible for your life. You simply mutter the words, I can't accept this gift. I'm not worthy. I'm not prepared for what this means. I imagine that this would be how Mary would have felt when an angel came to her telling her of the most amazing gift the world had ever seen. Let's read from Luke chapter 1 beginning in verse 26. And we're going to walk through scriptures this morning, and I will make comments as we go. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It says, and it begins, in the sixth month. Now let's stop right there for just a minute. You know, most of the time, when a major event is about to happen in scripture, it begins by letting us know a, an important event, a, a world-shaking event that's taking place, or, or who, is, who is king, or, or who is over. You know, it kind of lets us know how important this event is by the intro we get. For example, in, in Isaiah we read, In the year that King Uzziah died. In 1 Kings we read, 
in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. And even in the beginning of Luke's gospel, when the birth of John the Baptist is introduced, it begins with, in the time of King Herod, king of Judea. Now, the greatest news the earth has ever received is about to be told. We need to know the timeline. It needs to be introduced. Surely it coincides with the greatest people and the greatest events of the time. It's almost one of these moments where we need a drum roll, please. This happened in the sixth month of the birth and the pregnancy of Elizabeth. (laughs) It kind of just kills the moment, so to speak. It's like, what are we about to expect to hear when it's introduced by the pregnancy of a lady? What an entrance. You know, it makes sense, though, when we look and we remember what we talked about last week. Last week, we discovered that, that John's birth was told first. And his birth had all the fanfare. His birth had all the expectations of greatness. You see, people expected John the Baptist to be the Messiah. Remember what we said last week. You can write this down on on your outline. From his birth and through his death, Jesus put others first. That's how God works. He puts others first. And we even see in the entrance in this amazing news that is about to come, it's introduced by the pregnancy of Elizabeth. Let's keep on reading in verse 26. It said, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. You know, we look back in chapter 1, and you remember from last week, Zechariah, he had an encounter with an unnamed angel that appeared to him in the temple. You know, I kind of get the impression that 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 moment for that angel, who we don't even know his name, he appeared to Zechariah in the temple. He was burning incense to God. Zechariah is a priest. You know, he's kind of a Uh, you know, a well-to-do kind of guy. I mean, I kind of get the impression that that's the kind of places angels, if they could choose to show up somewhere, that's the kind of places they would choose to show up. It just kind of makes sense to me that that's angel stuff, you know, that that, that's what it's all about for an angel, to get picked to be that kind of spokesman. But now, I get a different impression I don't know if you got that when we read this. I get the impression that that God had to do a little convincing to Gabriel. And I have a feeling that Gabriel was kind of like, well, come on, God. You know, my buddy, he got to go to the temple while they're burning incense to a priest. And he got to deliver news in a setting that surely would be a little more honoring for an angel especially an angel like me. I'm Gabriel. And you, you want me to go? Say it again. Was, was that Nazareth? Is that where you want me to go? That place in Galilee? I don't know if you understand anything about Nazareth, but Nazareth had a bad reputation. The people of Nazareth were despised and condemned. You know, Nathaniel's response to when he heard that Jesus was from Nazareth, we can read it in John 1, 46. You know what he said? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Wow. And now Gabriel is asked to go to Nazareth. Now Gabriel is, he's kind of up there in the top two angels. And he's told to go to Nazareth. And then he's told, you're going to go speak to a woman. There again, not the kind of setting. I think that's why in in here, you know, in in Zechariah's story, it says that the angel just appeared. Kind of like, this is where I'm supposed to be. 
But here we see that God had to send. I kind of get the feeling God had to do a little pushing (laughs) to Gabriel. You're going to Nazareth, and you're going to appear to a woman. Look at verse 27. It says, To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. You know, Gabriel came to a virgin who was pledged to be married. Their names are given. We're introduced to Joseph, who was a descendant of David, and we're introduced to Mary. An engaged couple from Nazareth seemed to be the least likely candidates to raise the Messiah. And according to our worldly standards today, we would agree. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem fitting. But not according to God. And that's what we need to hear this morning. Listen, no one is trying to embellish this story. No one can make this story up to sound like this and to be like this. Nor should we. But I'm afraid we do sometimes. I want you to write this down. God doesn't need our help to decorate the gospel or make it sound more appealing. He doesn't need our help. But sometimes we do that. We want the gospel to be elegant. We want it to be sophisticated. We want the gospel to be polished. Let's remove the rough edges. Let's remove the people who have more rough edges than we do so that more people will respond to the gospel. But not Luke. Not Luke. If you remember from last week, we introduced Luke. Luke was a Gentile. He was the only Gentile writer of the gospels. And Luke was also a doctor. You see, Luke had a love for people. He loved all people. He wanted all people to be included in the gospel. And Luke, he had painstakingly interviewed Mary. We know that. He he, he interviewed Elizabeth. We know that. He got to the meat of the story and he said, I'm not going to embellish it. I'm not going to make it look better than it should because I want it to be included for all people, especially the underdogs like Mary and Joseph. You know, Paul understood this as well. That's why Paul says to the church of Corinth, all I can do is preach Christ crucified and its foolishness. I put this scripture on your outline, 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29. It says, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things like Mary and Joseph from Nazareth and the things that are not to nullify the things that are are, so that no one may boast before him. You know the famous statement, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. You know the only way that's possible for the last to be first and the first to be last, it simply means We all go the same. We're all going to be there the same. We're all coming before God the same. And I think we need to understand that, that we're going in together. The joy of undeserved grace and unlimited possibility makes this story most appealing. You know, when you look at this story, it's not the announcement That's appealing. It's not the location that's appealing. It's not the people of the story that are appealing or that we should be intrigued by. We should be intrigued by the message. Look at verse 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. Everybody say highly favored. favored. The Lord is is with you. I have a feeling, though, that many times we have misinterpreted these words, highly favored. 
you know, in our context, in our setting, in our culture, we see this as, well, that's the teacher's pet of the classroom who's highly favored. That's the, the captain of the football team who is highly favored. You see, but it's totally opposite of that. Highly favored means undeserved grace or full of grace. This doesn't mean that she was chosen over everyone else because she was smart and beautiful. It's not why she was chosen. She didn't have grace like a ballerina. But that's kind of how we choose Mary to play in our Christmas plays and cantatas. And that's kind of the the idea that we get that Mary was chosen because of something that she did to deserve it. What we need to understand about this is grace means getting what you don't deserve. That's what grace means. Mary understood she did not deserve this greeting. I want to put some of you at ease today because some of you, especially some of you girls, you've grown up trying to be like Mary. You've grown up thinking, God will show me favor if I can just act like Mary and earn God's favor. But the opposite is true. Mary did not earn or deserve this greeting in any way. It was simply a greeting of undeserved grace. And we know it troubled Mary. Look at verse 29. It says, Mary was greatly troubled. Everybody say, greatly troubled. She was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting might this be. Hey, let's not pass this over. Most of the time when someone had an encounter with an angel, man, they are greatly troubled by the bright lights and by the angels themselves showing up. And they are just like sorely afraid and they're ready to hide and they're feeling like their life is about over. But it is very clear here. Luke makes it very clear. Mary is not afraid of this angel and the way he has appeared to her. But she's greatly troubled at these words. And what are those words? You're highly favored because you're receiving undeserved grace. I want you to write this down. Undeserved grace troubles us. It troubles us. It doesn't make sense. It's so out of the ordinary. It's so not what we're used to. And the way that we usually practice life, usually we have to earn everything that we want. Usually we have to rise to the top. Usually we have to be likable to everyone in order to get picked but not Mary. She's troubled at this. And why is she troubled at this? Because she knows she's not worthy of receiving these words. If you are not troubled by undeserved grace that God has given you in your life, then you don't understand His grace. If you've never come to that moment where you can truly come and bow at the altar before God and say, I am not worthy then you've never really received that undeserved grace. There's a modern-day poet who writes an amazing poem that describes the way Mary must have felt because undeserved grace, I want you to write this down, makes us wonder, how can this be, she said. I want you to listen to this poem. At the end, I'm going to ask you if you know who wrote it. Some of you will. I am guilty, ashamed of what I've done, what I've become. These hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. I've been hiding, afraid I've let you down. Inside, I doubt that you still love me. But in your eyes, there's only grace now. Though I fall, you can make me new. 
From this death I will rise with you. Oh, the grace reaching out for me. How can it be? How can it be? You plead my cause. You right my wrongs. You break my chains. You overcome. You gave your life to give me mine. You say that I am free. How can it be? How can it be? Who's the author? Lauren Daigle. You know, I believe Mary felt much like Lauren Daigle, and she actually wrote her own poem. You can continue to read that in in Luke's gospel, where she wrote about that. But see, undeserved grace leaves us in that moment of, how can this possibly be? And that's the place that Mary was. I want to give a quick little warning this morning, though. Write this down on your outline. Undeserved grace brings out the best and the worst in people. It brings out the best and it brings out the worst. Some people will choose to trample on the grace of God. They use the grace of God as a license to keep on living in sin. That is one of the most dangerous places you can be in life. You know, we look at the the Old Testament, the Israelites, they trampled the grace of God over and over and over again. We see their cycle of sin, their cycle of repentance, their cycle, God forgives them, God restores them, God shows his favor, and then they trample the grace of God and they go right back into their sin. And they suffer the consequences for it. Some of you are trampling the grace of God right now in your life, and you know how absolutely miserable that can be. But you don't have to stay there. Joy's coming. You don't have to be that way. I want you to learn, you can can begin to guard your heart, you can begin to guard your mind from thinking thoughts like these. Well, it is easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. That's trampling on the grace of God. I'll go ahead and do it because I know God will forgive me anyway. That's trampling on the grace of God. Paul says in Romans 6, 1 and 2, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it? any longer how can we be satisfied in sin any longer how can we justify our sin any longer unless we just continue to choose to trample on the grace of God Mary was greatly troubled and she wondered so the angel said to her look at verse 30 this is the best part do not be afraid Mary you have found favor there it is again that is grace that is undeserved this is nothing she's done to earn this you have found favor with God you will be with child and give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus we just lost Mary here by the way (laughs) it really doesn't matter what else is about to be said we just lost her and I'll get back to that in a second it says he will be great He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Wow, there's some great stuff here. Mary, this completely went by her though, but the angel said, look, Jesus is going to be great. Jesus is going to be awesome. He's going to be the Son of the Most High. That means he will be equal to, to God. He will implement the messianic kingdom. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's big time news for Jews that this was going to happen. And he says his kingdom will be eternal. What he's saying is this is the last king the world will ever need. That's all amazing stuff. And I can imagine the angel's reaction after he told her of all of these things, when Mary asked the next question. You see, I just want to imagine this this scene unfolding. And 
the angel, who knows, for centuries has prepared this speech, has been told, Gabriel, you're going to be the one. One day, you're going to introduce Jesus to the world. That's your job. And I can imagine he just perfected those words, and it is. It is power-packed perfection of who Jesus is. And as he comes to Mary, and he, and he says this speech, and he gets to that triumphant ending, his kingdom will never end. And he looks at Mary, and Mary's like, um, wait a minute, let's, let's go back for a second. You, you said, I'm going to have a baby, and I'm a virgin. That's where it all stopped for her right there. That's where the rest of that and all the description of Jesus is like, you could have you said anything you wanted about Jesus at that point. She was still stuck at, I'm going to have a baby, and I'm a virgin. How will this be? You know, some of us are stuck at that question today. That's where we're living life today. How will this be? God has spoken to you. He has said and spoken into your life, I love you. I will extend my undeserved grace to you. You are highly favored. No matter where you come from, and no matter what people think about you or how they look down on you, he says, you're highly favored. You matter to me. He has said to you, trust me and follow me. He says, here's my resume. <laughs> it's pretty good. Trust me. Nothing can go wrong with me. But you're stuck. Somewhere in the back. Where you're saying, how will this be? I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too uneducated. I'm not a speaker. I'm shy. I'm not bold. I'm too poor. I have low self-esteem. How can this be? Or some of you are, I'm too rich. How can this be? I'm too popular. How can this be? I, I already have it all figured out. Where are you stuck in your how can this be? If that's you today, I want you to listen very carefully. You see, Mary was not doubting like Zechariah did. This was not doubting. This is not disbelief. She is caught in a moment of absolute wonder. Am I ready for what this means to have a baby as a virgin? Am I ready for this? How will this be since I'm a virgin? You will do this through me. A virgin of Nazareth? Come on. This doesn't happen around here. This doesn't happen among our people, but wow. Mary's ready. But she needed a little help. And this is where maybe where some of you are today. You need a little help. Look what Gabriel says in verse 35. Gabriel says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Mary needs the Holy Spirit. Mary needs the power of the Most High to overshadow her just like we do. You know, most of the time we say statements like, I don't want to live in someone else's shadow. But we do when it comes to the Most High God. We want to live in His shadow. So here's what you need to do. Write this down on your outline. And then I'll explain it. Stop asking and start receiving. Stop asking, how can this be? And start receiving the Holy Spirit and the power of God. Because I want to ask you this question. And I want you to answer out loud. You ready? When the Holy Spirit comes on you and the power of God overshadows you, is any 
nothing impossible for you? No. No. Absolutely nothing. And that's why Gabriel said in verse 36, look at it. He says, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. Say this with me. For nothing is impossible with God. Say it with me again. For nothing is impossible with God. I hope this morning for some of you, this message has stirred up a lot of energy and a lot of excitement about your life with God and about the hope for your future that nothing is impossible. Some of you, you will gladly hand over your life to God. You will give him a blank sheet of paper or a blank canvas and you will say to him, God, have your way with me. God, there's nothing impossible with you. I give my life to you. You create the story. You create the future. Holy Spirit, fill me and overshadow me. But for some of you, this message, like many, may not make a difference in your life. And I want you to write this down. If you have created all the possibilities for your life and you are satisfied, do you need Jesus? I want to let that sink in for a minute. If you have created all the possibilities for your life and you are satisfied with those, do you really need Jesus? You have it all covered. You've planned it out, who you're going to date, who you're going to marry. You've planned it out, what kind of job you want to have, how much money you want to make, where you want to live, how you want to spend your life. You've planned out your retirement. You've planned out your future. You have it all covered. There's no other possibilities. And here's the scary part. Many of you are satisfied there. You're satisfied with that life. But let me tell you this, being satisfied is not joy, and you know that. There's no joy there. You see, true joy is living with undeserved grace. True joy is living under that undeserved grace. I don't deserve this. I didn't earn this. God chose me. Nothing I could have done to make him choose me anymore, love me anymore. And he's given me unlimited possibilities. Well, that ought to be some stand up and shout and get happy and excited kind of news. There are unlimited possibilities with God. But it only happens when we respond as Mary did. You see... The angel came to her. The angel told her the news. The angel shared with her this undeserved grace that she's going to receive. The angel shared with her that, listen, I know you've got all these what ifs. You've got all these questions. You've got, well, well, I, I, I can't do it because I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too rich. I'm too poor. I'm from Nazareth. And God says, the angel said to her, there's nothing impossible with God but Mary had to respond and so do you today look at verse 38 Mary says I am the Lord's servant may it be to me as you have said then the angel left her that's the response if you want to live with oh If you want to live under God's grace, if you want to live with unlimited possibilities of what God can do, then we respond the way Mary responded. I want to give you the opportunity this morning to respond. We're going to do it in kind of a creative way. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes, and I'm going to ask you to have a palms up prayer time this morning. That simply means out in front of you on your knees, just put your palms up like this. If everybody would, just bow your heads. Put your hands on your knees. 
with your palms up. A palms up prayer is a prayer of giving and receiving. It means you are releasing something. You're opening your hands. The things that you've held on to in life, you are releasing those to God. You're releasing. I, how can this be? How can you use me? You're releasing all the possibilities that you've been holding on to in life. You've created all those possibilities. And now you open your palms and you say, God, I release those possibilities into your hands. I want unlimited possibilities. But with your palms up, it's also a position of receiving. Receiving from God. I'm going to ask you to make this prayer this morning. And I'm going to ask you to say these words out loud. And repeat after me. I'm going to say them one time, and then I'm going to ask you to repeat them the second time I say them. And you need to understand, by saying these words, you're saying, this is what I mean. This is what I'm going to pray this morning. I believe nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Just take a second. If you truly want to pray those prayers to God this morning, repeat after me. I believe nothing is impossible with God. I believe nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. May it be to me as you have said. Father, I pray in this time that we would truly mean those words. Father, that we would no longer rely on the possibilities of life that we have created for ourselves, but we would rely on the impossibilities that you can do through us. Because nothing is impossible with you. We'll have faith. We'll trust. And oh, sweet Mary, we think about her this young girl from a no-name place in Nazareth that were people there were condemned and despised, she said a prayer like this, and her life changed forever. I pray in this room this morning some would mean this prayer. They would say this from their heart. And Father, you would begin to work in their life in impossible ways to us, but they're not impossible to you. Father, I pray... As they've said this prayer this morning that they realize they cannot do it on their own as Mary could not either. We need the Holy Spirit, the power of the Most High God to overshadow us. May we leave here in that power and that spirit. Father, I pray for some this morning that today is the day they want to receive Jesus. They want to be saved. God, I pray holy spirit would draw them i pray for some this morning that are deciding to join eastwood baptist church father that you would make it clear if this is the place where you want them to be for all of us this morning god we want to respond in obedience to what you've said to us today we pray in jesus name amen